Good day everybody, welcome back to Falcon's Rest. Today we're going to be discussing several commonly encountered health-related issues. These will include frowns, bumblefoot, and aspergillosis. Over to you, Joe. Bumblefoot, also known clinically as ulcerative pododermatitis, is an infection that originates from an injury to the foot of the animal we're concerned with. This isn't something we see strictly in captive reared birds of prey. It's something we also find in guinea pigs and small wild birds like starlings and pigeons who are living in dirty city environments. So, pododermatitis, bumblefoot, begins with something like an innocuous injury, a pinprick from their own talon. If this goes undiscovered and is not cleaned out immediately upon discovery, the bacterium can enter into the space between the skin and the muscle and tendon region. Now, it can be exacerbated by standing on unclean perching surfaces. So it's of critical import that you're very choosy in the kinds of perching surfaces you're providing. They should be limited to things like longleaf astroturf or sand-enriched polyurethane perches, which are similar to the same kinds of gripping sites that you find in indoor rock climbing wall type facilities. Your bumblefoot prevention strategy is a multifaceted one. It includes diet, exercise, dedication to good stewardship practices like close inspection, routine inspection of your feathered one's feet. This spills over into good deep cleaning practices. What are you using and how often are you using solutions such as vinegar and water or a multitude of environmentally friendly cleaning products to sterilize the perching surfaces that they're using. Now we have a video that was shot recently on a deep cleaning routine that we do here. If you have any questions, we love questions here. Send me your questions, I'd be glad to answer them on strategies that you can use for good stewardship practices in preventing bumblefoot. Frounce is an infectious disease caused by a single cell protozoan called Trichomonas gallinea. This is a yeast infection of the digestive tract and systems in general. It starts off as what are called plaques, and these start off very small, the size of a pinhead. You will see green mutes. You will, as it progresses, start to see and witness a lethargic, fluffed up appearing bird, a bird that's not interested in its surroundings. There is a very distinct yeasty smell associated with frowns. Other symptoms you might witness as this disease comes on are things like food flicking. They can even develop difficulty breathing and you may well see regurgitation. Now, where this becomes a little problematic is we see a lot of overlap in these kinds of symptoms between a number of different issues that come up but put together, suspect frowns. As this travels down into the air passages and sinuses, it becomes increasingly serious. We will have a bird that will potentially perish within seven to 10 days, so prevention is key. What do I mean by prevention? This often is brought on by poor food handling practices or sourcing food that is coming from factory farm environments where maybe they're not taking all the measures possible to ensure that the Dale rooster chicks or quail or what have you that are being raised are being kept in the best of health themselves. Maybe they're in environments where the air circulation isn't that great or their own food source is contaminated. This has a knock-on effect. It has a downstream step-by-step -step effect when these sorts of things are left to chance. What kind of environment is the food source coming from? How good are your handling practices in the preparation of the food? Are you ensuring that your hands are clean? Are you removing and disposing of in a healthy fashion all parts of the food that you're providing that your feathered one does not need to be eating in the first place? All of these things as a continuum come down once again to good stewardship practices. 
Frounce is an easily preventable issue. One of the main trajectories or vectors through which Frounce gets into hunting long wings, or in other words falcons, is through the ingestion of the heads and crops of wild squab or pigeons. It might be an idea to not encourage the hunting of pigeons by your long wing. If they do happen to take a pigeon, it might be advisable to do your best to remove that quarry from them as soon as you can possibly do so and provide them with something else that they're familiar with that they find appealing. It could be a nice piece of juicy bison or the hard organs of a duck or something of that nature. If you're going to feed squab, be on the alert for frounce. This is one of the biggest things that long wings encounter. A well-known example of birds that have been exposed to frounce are the famous pale male, the red tail, who lives, or lived, in Central Park, New York. Uh, in addition to a number of his mates, because he had six or seven of them, over the course of his lifetime, in addition to poisonings, frounce was one of the things that came up as things that shortened the lifespan of the females he was partnered with over the course of his lifetime. So, in closing, good stewardship practices again. Prevention is always the best approach. And if you're going to be hunting squab, please be on the alert for this, probably above all other things. Aspergillus is a ubiquitous fungal mold. We find it everywhere in nature. Now, it comes in two forms, nodular or systemic. The nodular, for lack of a better term, is this mold becomes a tumor inside the bronchi and air sacs that lead to the lung, which of course cuts off the function of the lung, making it impossible to breathe. There are a number of different forms of aspergillus. We won't dwell on that. We'll provide some information down below, some links that you can look up to educate yourself on the many different iterations of aspergillus. Now, when something like this rears its head in your muse, in the muse, the sorts of symptoms that you're gonna be seeing are gurgling. Uh, there'll be a change in the voice, raspy, whistly quality to the voice. They're thirstier than normal. Every bird of prey takes a drink from the side of their bath pan from time to time, especially on a hot day. If we're noticing that they're doing that a lot, it's not a hot day, and they've been doing this for several days in a row, this becomes a flag. This becomes something to pay attention to. They'll also get into something called food flicking, where they're pulling at their food, they're hungry, but they're flicking it around because it's just not appetizing. More obvious symptoms, more progressive symptoms, are things like weight loss. A fluffed appearance, a sunken-eyed appearance, a disinterest in their surroundings. They're not watching what's going on in the garden. They're not paying attention to any of that sort of thing. With aspergillosis, which is the descriptor used to apply to the condition itself, once it passes into the air sacs of our feathered one, this is, the prognosis is not very good. We're looking at probably an under 4% success rate in saving them. So once again, it all comes back to good stewardship and great housekeeping. This is right down to where are we getting our food sources from? What are their practices where they're raising the day-old rooster chicks and quail? What are our practices once we get that home? Are we keeping it in a really frigid freezer? Are we making sure our hands are clean? All preparation surfaces are kept nice and clean. Once we suspect that this has happened, then we have to engage in a scorched earth kind of approach. We're dosing the muse with highly powerful chemicals to kill off all microbial life. We're throwing away all the food sources that we've got, even if we just spent $300 yesterday. We cannot take any chances on cross contamination, so this means 
throwing out gauntlets. If you can't remember whether you've been handling several birds together with the same glove or not, we've got to pitch those out. We cannot take the chance. And the bird or bird that we suspect may have been exposed has to be sequestered. They have to be quarantined away from all the other ones. This can pass through a muse like lightning and kill all of your feathered ones. The prognosis is not very good even if we intercept this early on. 25% is about average. It can be as much as 40% survival rate. It really, really helps if you've got a highly experienced, knowledgeable veterinarian that specializes, has a subspecialty in birds of prey, but at least birds. Because chances are he or she has an understanding of how this affects the systems of a bird. Prevention is key here. Can't be emphasized enough. Other things to keep in mind, as I mentioned before, is because it is zoonotic, we really do need to make sure that even if we feel great, we go and see our GP, get tested, and get the medications that will help us to rapidly progress through it ourselves. And the best thing is to just prevent, and barring that, really, really hope that it doesn't come our way. We'll provide you some links down below, once again, to resources that you can access and ask questions of from people who are far more experienced than I in this particular arena and would rather not be more experienced at all. Hey you, you ready? Are we ready? Are we ready? <laughs> hey guys. Well, we hope you found that really informative and, uh, you know, we got to say, Leah and I just are loving sharing our passion with you guys. It's just been brilliant, this whole collaborative, co-creative experience. We're loving your comments, loving the questions. Keep bringing those questions. If you've got any ideas or suggestions for, for things that you'd like to see, hey, let us know. This is, this is a, as much about bringing things to you to help your understanding as it is us sharing what we love with you guys. Let other people know about us. Like, subscribe, and I really hope you're having a marvelous weekend wherever you are. Cheers. Hey, bud. Good for you. Make you big and strong like bull. <laughs> okay, I'll leave you alone. <laughs>